Thank you very much. Um, so what I want to talk about is the role that context plays when we think about liveness. And what that means is that for right now, I'd like to talk about the uncanny valley in terms of really it being about ambiguity about the liveness of something. And that maybe a specific instance of that is in the case of ambiguity about the humanness of something. But I think most of us have seen at some point this video, either uh, at a conference or on YouTube. So this is the Boston Dynamics robot that is remarkably good at not falling down. <laughs> and last uh, IFRA, when we had this workshop on the Uncanny Valley and the Umheimlich, this robot came up. What was interesting is that how you respond to this video largely depends on what your background is. To a roboticist, Many of us see this video as being the natural physical response of reactive controllers responding to the gravity vector, possibly responding to contact laws. If your background is less technically specific to this domain, you can have an extremely uncanny response to watching this video. And so somehow our personal context is, of course, critical to the question of familiarity. Now, in my own work, we became interested in puppets. And I'd like you to think for a moment what it would be like several hundred years ago when puppets were used to educate, uh, potentially to enforce dogma from a distance where you don't get to see the person that's involved. These are very compelling motions. These motions make us feel, despite the difference in scale and despite the fact that we can maybe see the strings, they evoke humanness and liveness in a way that only once you start to find out what's going on behind the scenes do you lose that sense of the uncanny. Um, in, in my lab, we probably lost that sense of the uncanny as much as anyone. We've built large degree, high degree of freedom marionettes. We can control them reasonably well, we can simulate them well, we can synthesize controllers for them well, and at every step, as we improve on our ability to control the marionettes, puppets, anytime that I now see them in performance, I find them interesting and I'm impressed with the puppeteers, but I no longer find them uncanny. Even the most amazing motions that a puppeteer might be able to create, I am technically astounded by but my personal sensation of the uncanny has now largely been lost. Similarly, how do we think, like when we look at something that we know is alive, what are the facets of, of its aliveness that convince us? So here, this is Malcolm McIver's group at Northwestern. They look at electrosense fish. This is a fish that is an actual biological fish, a real fish, that is capturing a pr uh, prey that's in the water. And as it does so, it combines its dynamics and it combines its sensing modality, which are these weak electric fields. And it does a motion that, to me, is very much a facet of its liveness. This is how, when I see something that I know is an animal, it's how I discern that it's alive. But in my lab, as we've made progress, on understanding how one might automate such a, pro such a process. Here we see, this is actually an experiment of a robotic fish, and the motion on the left is entirely dictated by the need to increase information on the right. So this is information with respect to a particular parameter, and the hot spot that you're seeing is the intensity of, with which you understand where something is. And the entire trajectory on the left looks very organic in many respects, but it's entirely dictated by the need to improve information subject to dynamics and subject to the sensing modality. So what's interesting about this to me is that as we make progress, 
the robots are becoming more and more alive, and at the exact same time, the fish is becoming less so. Because observing a fish now as it explores its environment is no longer one of the ways in which I evaluate liveness. In fact, so in some very real way, fish have become less alive to me personally by virtue of what we've been doing. And so coming back to the uncanny valley, I think that there's an interesting question, one that we are maybe now realistically facing for the first time in, say, the past decade, which is as robots move closer and closer to having similar levels of liveness as people, we, of course, run the risk that people themselves could fall into the uncanny valley, because not all people behave in the exact same way. There's variation across different people, and even across healthy people, as robots start to infringe on the territory that we have historically preserved for humanness, we may find that people that are somehow outliers, healthy but nevertheless outliers, strike us as, as uncanny because of the ambiguity about whether they are a person or whether they are simply a very human-like robot. In particular, in the area of prosthetics, I think that this is something that, as, as we see more and more prosthetics that are innervated within the human body, that can be controlled by the human body, and that have tremendous physical likeness to the human body, simply seeing someone move in an overtly mechanical way might call into question the totality of their humanness. So I would like to uh, thank Professor Mori for being here, because this curve, I think, as much as anything, has provided us all a way of discussing these profound issues in a way that can be presented and that can be a common to all of us. And as robotics becomes increasingly philosophical, having these foundations to work from will be increasingly important. Thank you.